So we'll have two for this class. Um, that's okay. All right, so we're going to spend the rest of our time together uh, going through this test, if you will, um, and talking through the answers and then any kind of um, ideas and stuff that come out of, of the questions and answers. Um, so let's use the chat feature to answer the questions and we'll start we're looking at sociological factors in partner selection. Um, first question is true false. And as an operative theory, it is agreed upon that women seek men who will provide economic support. Is that true or false? I'm waiting for people to answer in the chat. It's true. True. Does anyone disagree? I see someone um, chose false. Can anyone tell me what's the, the theoretical um, kind of underpinnings for that? I think that women are mostly looking for a partner who will be able to provide um, like child support or stuff like that. So, you know, uh, this way she will be able to focus on herself and children, for example, or something like that. Yep. And so from kind of an evolutionary perspective, uh, the concept of sociobiology suggests that women do look for people, men who um, can uh, reproduce with them and then who will in turn take care of those offspring, right? Um, you might also look at it through the lens of the um, exchange theory, which I think will come up again in another question, but um, that's this idea that um, we seek partners who can offer us reward and at the lowest cost, right? And so sometimes the reward um, is we find a partner who is a good provider, um, caretaker, et cetera, but that's all kind of related to this idea that women do in fact tend to seek men who can provide economic support for their offspring. It's true. Um, true or false in the chat, people seek out others who have the same level of physical attractiveness. So like a two um, on the one to 10 scale is going to be kind of looking for a two to three or a nine, 10 looking for a nine, 10. It's a true statement, right? Um, and we're going to probably talk more about this idea of homogamy, um, but uh, homogamy relates to this idea of physical attractiveness and lots of other characteristics. And the general premise there is that like tends to look for and to seek out like. Right, so we look for people who are similar to us in um, kind of those key traits, hold similar values, that type of thing. Um, so number three, is it people normally choose partners of the same age, race, education, or D, all of the above? All of the above, right, I just said all that. Um, and that's because of the premise, um, the principle of homogamy or seeking a homogamous partner. So we'll skip over number four because um, that's the answer. <laughs> uh, and so kind of to put it into practice, according to this principle of homogamy, someone who is very strong and independent, likes to take care of others, would likely go for someone who is loud and annoying, someone who is insecure and needy, or someone who is confident and smart. What do you think? can use the chat or if someone wants to call it out, if you feel very confident with your answer, take it away. So someone says confident and smart, C in the chat. Right, because we're talking about um, like attracts like, right? And so someone strong, independent, likes to take care of others would likely be attracted to a similar natured person. Um, although that leads us into this next question, which is, what is the complementary needs theory? Is anyone willing to unmute and share what they think the answer? I don't they have heard? headphones. Sorry. Really? 
I wasn't know. I wasn't know. That sucks. Um, is anyone willing to unmute and say what the complementary needs theory suggests? <clears throat> Or type it into the chat. And if no one knows the answer, maybe someone from group two can give us the answer. What is complementary needs theory? Opposites attract. Sometimes we select mates whose needs are opposite yet complementary. Right. So generally speaking, in terms of attractiveness, we're still looking at this principle of homogamy in that we're likely going to select someone who has similar religious values, similar maybe politics, um, similar finances, those type of kind of big picture ideas. Uh, complementary needs theory kind of looks specifically at like internal characteristics, um, psychological traits and those type of things. And that's where we see this idea that sometimes opposites attract. So um, in the example from question number five, someone who is very strong, independent, and likes to take care of others might also be attracted to someone who is insecure and needy because they have this um, sort of psychological balance at play, right? Or another example is, um, if I am sort of high strung, hyperactive, um, maybe anxious, nervous in terms of my personality, I might seek a partner who is more calm, more stable. Um, and that's just because those, those needs tend to balance one another out. So a little bit contradictory, um, but they are both sort of operative principles in terms of partner selection um, that have been noted in the research. Questions on that? Because I know they sound like they're opposing. OK. Uh, what does attachment theory focus on? Use the chat or shout it out. <clears throat> the drive towards intimate social and emotional connection. So we watched a video early on in the course about attachment styles related to love. And those are built on this principle of um, that, you know, the, the, the purpose of mate selection is our internal drive towards an intimate social and emotional connection. That of course starts with our relationship with our birth parents. Um, and then we sort of look for that later on in a partner, that emotional intimacy. Uh, three undesirable personality characteristics. So those would be coming from, can someone from group two point us towards those in the text? Page 98, 99, is that correct? So there's kind of a laundry list in your book on page 98 and 99 of things that we don't want in a partner. Um, we don't want people who are controlling, narcissistic, have lack of impulse control, people who are hypersensitive, have a large ego, perfectionistic, insecure, controlled, substance users and abusers, unhappy people, promiscuous, um, or people who have a hard time in social interactions. And I think it's pretty clear from that list, um, many of the reasons why those characteristics wouldn't be attractive. Although I would venture to say that in some relationships, um, people with maybe less healthy patterns of, um, of relationships, you know, some of those characteristics might sort of subconsciously or unconsciously be attractive, um, usually don't lend themselves to the best outcomes, but um, it does happen. But generally speaking, those are not what we look for in people. Um, so exchange theory, can someone unmute and explain what is exchange theory? It's uh, something that uh, you view relationships on like what rewards you can get and like the lowest cost of like 
the opposite like the punishments of like the lowest possible amount of that could be in a relationship right so and we we talked about this framework early on as a way to understand relationships um but specifically related to partner relationships and partner selection we see this idea of social exchange or exchange theory um and so what are some rewards then that you know we might consider in in the social exchange theory we talked about one right um care for offspring <clears throat> can anyone think of others to add to that in the chat or out loud whichever you prefer financial stability yes economic benefits what about just like division of labor, you know, someone else, a partner who shares chores around the house. Um, those, those ideas are all kind of embedded in this bigger picture concept of what we're looking for in terms of those rewards from a partnership. Um, and then, of course, we want that to come at the lowest cost to us. Um, and that's the basis of this theory. Uh, and then which theory emphasizes that a son or a daughter models after the parent of the same sex by choosing a partner similar to the one that the parent chose? Role theory. So role theory of mate selection suggests that we as a species tend to model our partner selection in the same regard as you know if in my case i would pick a husband who is similar to my father because i'm picking a partner who's similar to the partner that my mother chose um so there's kind of two ways of understanding but that's the role theory of partner selection <clears throat> questions or comments all right let's talk about endogamy and exogamy um what's what you can chat it out or you can just ch talk what is endogamy as compared to exogamy endogamy is partner selection within your social group i see that in the chat um and so the opposite of that then is exogamy right when you are selecting a partner and sometimes it's because of pressure from social groups um sometimes it's just because of a you know whatever your internal drive is but it's selecting a partner that's outside of of your social group so outside of your culture outside of your you know kind of religious upbringings um whatever the case may be uh, so endogamy relates to homogamy right and then exogamy is kind of the opposite idea um so for number two what is the best example of exogamy a b or c I think C is the best answer and we might see A as being kind of a possible answer because sometimes rebellion against one's family of origin might contribute to exogamy right but certainly C is the best example here in that feeling of pressure and a desire to marry outside of your social group. The text talks about arranged marriages and how those still exist in certain cultures um, and so these are an example of a cultural factor of mate selection um, i'm giving this one away and that it's true um, sometimes outside influences or parents still are responsible for partner selection um, in some cultures and for some individuals <clears throat> uh, what is the answer for number four controversial theory that states that women are likely to select a partner based on their capacity for healthy offspring We've already mentioned this one. Uh, 
Uh, so the answer is C, sociobiological theory, right? And that looks at that kind of evolutionary mechanism um, behind partner selection as it relates to reproduction and offspring. And then another word for exogamy could be, my inclination is to say outmarriage. Um, can group three give us the answer for that one? Um, I had said out marriage just because it was just like dealing with outside of your own marriage. So, yep. I mean, that was, that was basically my theory. Okay, perfect. Yep. Outside of your group, um, outside of your social experience. And that is the basic idea behind exogamy. Um, moving on to the, the idea of online opportunities. We all know what being ghosted is, right? Even if it's never happened to you, um, we get the idea. And so that's just like a one-sided cutting off of the relationship, particularly in the online space, um, but it can happen in real life also. Um, true or false, physical attractiveness is the most desirable trait for men and women. Use the chat, true or false. It's sad, but true friends. It is sad, but true. Or maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yes, that, and, and so when we look at matchmaking research um, and lots of digging into this idea, that is um, the most desirable trait um, that, that has been identified. And, and again, remember that it's kind of um, that idea of homogamy plays in here. So um, people are kind of looking to match with someone who's on their same level, if you will, um, of physical attractiveness. Uh, someone unmute, please, and give us the premise of uh, catfishing. What is catfishing online? Lying about who you are, whether it is like physical, um, whether, you know, oh, I'm single or, oh, I'm married. Um, just lying about who you are and hiding it from the person you're talking to in any way, shape, or form. Yes. So specific to online dating, online interactions, and it is a false representation of oneself in whatever way. Um, so sometimes it's use of a fake picture, um, fake, you know, identification, sometimes lying about one's personal um experiences like being married or not, all those things can be considered catfishing in the online space. Um, here's a question. Taylor was in a relationship through an online dating website and all communication was cut off by her partner. Is that ghosting or catfishing? <coughs> ghosting. Um, and then we know that some people do practice catfishing um, and so that last one would be true. All right, now we're thinking about moving from like dating and partner selection, and we're kind of shifting towards moving towards that commitment of being um, married. What are some reasons for a prenuptial agreement? Someone willing to unmute and give us an answer. What are some reasons that you might employ a prenup? somebody is more wealthy from the start or they do have like a huge inheritance at hand yep. generally related to finances right um <clears throat> and so when one partner has more assets coming into the relationship than another or someone mentioned in the chat protecting children sometimes this is related to protecting children from a previous marriage so that whatever inheritance you have would go directly to your children and not to your partner um, but those are kind of the two main reasons for prenup and they're again mostly related to finances inheritance that type of thing um, in our society engagement is a pretty traditional step towards marriage um, so that's, you know, kind of the formalization of the commitment. Um, 
There's a question number three. What do you see as far as the future of our relationship? What is that described as? Can someone from group, is this group five? Give us your thoughts on that. Um, what question did you, I'm in group five, but I'm sorry, I didn't hear Question it. number three. Oh, oh, we said it's the talk. Yep. So our text gives us this idea of having the talk um, as a step towards marriage, right? And this is basically um, so that both parties are going into it informed and kind of on the same page. Um, and the, the general question is like, kind of what do you see as far as the future of this relationship? <coughs> um, that's kind of more the traditional approach. It's uh, generally people have that conversation before, you know, um, proposing or, or moving towards engagement and they kind of establish this is where we're headed. Uh, true or false premarital counseling is detrimental to the relationship. False. Um, and one of your written reflections kind of focused on premarital counseling and how that might be beneficial. Um, certainly not necessary, but uh, would would be seen as having um, possible benefits to the relationship. Um, and then let me hear from somebody out loud. What are your thoughts on the benefits of visiting a partner's parents before marriage? Why is that piece of kind of meeting the family important? Well, I think, first of all, you'll be able to see how um, how this person's parents are interacting with each other or what are they doing? Because most of the times uh, children are following steps of their parents. So I think it's like that. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a critical piece of it is that we sort of know that we um, even if we don't do it intentionally, right? We model our relationships after what we know um, from our home relationships. So you might gain some insight in terms of how your partner interacts based on watching their family of origin interact. You can also learn a whole lot about culture, uh, religion, values, those type of sort of um, social factors that we've talked about in the text from engaging with one's family of origin. Um, and so I would say that's a um, kind of a really important piece. Although, you know, in our society today, a lot of times we live far away from our families of origin. Um, we're much more spread out than we used to be. So that is not always something that happens in this kind of progression from dating to engagement to marriage, um, but certainly would have um, lots of benefits and, and is probably, an important piece that should not be um, skipped over if it can be helped. Um, moving on to thinking about marriage for the wrong reasons. This question asks us to select the false statement regarding marriage due to an unplanned pregnancy. Is it couples who marry when the woman becomes pregnant have an increased chance of divorce the decision of whether to marry should be kept separate from decisions about a pregnancy or children born as a result of unplanned pregnancies do not flourish as well if their birth parents do not remain together. A, B, or C, which one is false? There's also a fourth one. And then there's a D down there. I'm sorry, on the second page. Um, adoption, abortion, single parenthood, and unmarried parenthood serve as good alternatives to marriage due to unplanned pregnancy. So which idea here is false, A, B, C, or D? I see people putting C in the chat. Um, and so the take home message here is that you do not have to get married if you experience an unplanned pregnancy, because A, B, and D are all true. 
Um, children from these circumstances tend to have better outcomes if they're raised, you know, in single parent homes or by separate parents um, co-parenting because that decision of whether or not to marry and to live together as partners should remain separate from the decision to have and raise a child. Um, and, and we see more positive outcomes when those two situations, circumstances are kind of teased apart. <clears throat> um, question number two on this section, which reasons for marrying the wrong person describe the following quote, I will commit suicide if you leave me. Please do not marry the person that says that to you. <laughs> and why? Because that is C, psychological blackmail. Um, these other ideas are also really wrong reasons to marry someone. So you don't want to marry someone because you're trying to escape your family circumstances. You don't want to marry someone because you're looking for them to fill the void within you. And you certainly don't want to marry someone because you pity them. Um, but you also, psychological blackmail is a form of emotional abuse. And you don't want to marry someone who's going to be abusive in any regard. Um, and so let's talk about that idea, though, of filling the void. Can someone talk about what that looks like, feels like? What's the idea there? You can find information about that on page 111 if you need an example. It's uh, pretty much just like when someone feels like super alone and empty without a partner, so they feel like they need to fill like the void that they feel inside of them with another person. Um, and so they think that if they will get married, then that person will be like permanently attached to them kind of and it will, they will permanently fill that void. So it's not a good reason to get married. Surely not. And anytime we place our need for fulfillment, for happiness, um, for anything that we should be cultivating within ourselves, anytime we place that on another person, we're setting ourselves up for a, a poor experience in a relationship and we're placing way too much pressure on our partner, right? Um, the void within me has to be filled um, by me or, or some other mechanism, but I cannot look to another person um, to do that. And sometimes we see this happen uh, like in circumstances where someone has died or, you know, you have this kind of like lack in your life um, and then you, you rebound to a partner to try to compensate for that lack. Um, but as you've pointed out, it's, it's not a reason to establish a relationship with someone. Um, and so from this list on number four, select which of the following are wrong reasons to get married. Um, all of those, am I right? All of uh, those. There are two that aren't. Oh, okay. Can you there tell are, us? Yeah, it's revenge and fall in love too quickly. Like those are not good, re like those technically are wrong reasons to get married, but there are like seven specific ones that are listed. Got it. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, the only thing that I'll point out in terms of um, fell in love too quickly <clears throat> is basically what we know about relationships and marriages in particular is that the longer a couple waits to get married, um, the better the outcome of their relationship will be, right? So anything that serves to kind of delay marriage has implications as being beneficial to the relationship. Um, so even if you fall in love really quickly and the relationship is hot and heavy and moves quickly, um, that's okay. But I would say postponing marriage as much as possible um, will, it just increases your chances to have a more successful marriage. Um, and then the last question, a partner feeling guilty for their partner and staying with them because of that guilt would be an example of which one of these? Is that pity or psychological blackmail from group seven? It's pity. 
pity, right? So, um, and this is kind of a form of psychological blackmail that we impose on ourselves, right? Um, I, you know, it's not overtly stated by the partner, but because of my own feelings of guilt about leaving someone or what might happen to them if I break off the relationship, um, then I pity them so much that I stay in, in the relationship. Um, so lots of reasons why we shouldn't. And then um, at the beginning, we kind of talked about the underpinnings of why we do look for partners to mate with. Um, and we'll look at some more specifics related to that idea in the asynchronous um, content for this week. And then we'll be moving on to talking about different types of marriage relationships next time we come back together. Anyone have questions, concerns, ideas? All right, thank you for your time. I have your name uh, recorded on the Google Doc, so we're good for attendance today. And please remember, if you want your extra credit in, um, I need that by midnight on Saturday, the 19th. Alex, do you have a question? Yeah, just like a small one. Um, kind of relating back to like one of those questions that group seven asked, I just kind of thought that insurance like benefits would be seen as maybe like a slight good reason. And I understand like the book emphasizes that like if it's the sole reason then it's bad, which I understand. But like what about for like, like cohabiting relationships where people aren't really in it to get married, but then they figure out something like both of them have this and this and it would be beneficial to them if they got married to like better that. But like, could that be another like, uh, like leading on reason that they could get married or is it just a wrong reason period? So I think um, particularly when we think about remarriages and marriages later on in life, making the decision to marry someone around like financial security and economic benefit could be a sound reason, especially when both partners have probably already had some experience with marriage relationships um, or, you know, they've had enough time living life to kind of know what they need, want, desire, their communication style, all of those things. Um, I think I would say I would be very careful with making marriage decisions around economic and financial choices early on just because those other things that I mentioned are not well established, you know? And so you don't want to marry someone for financial advan advantage if you don't know that their relationship style, communication style, all of that stuff is going to work, you know? That's my take on that. Let's see. Um, thank you for that. Sure. And I apologize. I see that people have asked. Um, I must have skipped over a group in my um, in my goings on, and I'm sorry, Jules. Did I skip over the sixth group? Let me look. I think I probably did. Um, so since we've lost a lot of people, um, how about if I will email and ask everyone to upload their answers and then we'll have the shared doc and we'll have answers to all the questions and that way you guys can go back and access um, and everyone has the opportunity to look at that. I apologize. <clears throat> all right, you're free to go if you don't have anything else. Thank you. Um, I, have a, um, I have a question, actually. I came in a little bit late.